Welcome to Uncommon Core, where we explore the big ideas in crypto from first principles. Today, I brought on Dan Robinson and Georgios Konstantopoulos, who are both research partners at Paradigm. Together, we explore the topic of MEV, or Minor Extractable Value. Blockchains like Ethereum have this dirty little secret that, while in most regards they are very decentralized, the ordering of transactions within a single block is actually completely in the hands of a single miner. They can insert their own transactions, rearrange those of users, or even censor them completely. MEV describes how much value a miner can extract from users and other miners by using these powers to their advantage. And if you've never looked into MEV before, I think you'll be both shocked and fascinated by the complexity and sophistication of the war that is raging inside Ethereum's memory pool. Enjoy. Dan and Georgios, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having us on. Thanks for having us. Dan, could you start by introducing yourself to our audience? I'm Dan Robinson. I'm a research partner at Paradigm. Um, and in past lives, I was a lawyer and then a crypto protocol engineer. Hi, I'm Georgios Konstantopoulos. I used to be a consultant in, um, in crypto and now I'm also a research partner in Paradigm. I brought you to here to um, talk about one of my favorite topics, which is mempool games and MEV and um, front running in Ethereum. So to start this conversation off, most people have used wallet like MetaMask before to send a transaction on Ethereum and they roughly understand how the user experience works from their perspective, right? So you create a transaction, you set a fee rate, and then you publish it to the network. And if you selected a high enough fee, then most of the time you should hear familiar bing a few seconds later and your transaction has been confirmed. But I feel like this is one of the cases where behind a simple user experience, there's actually a lot of complexity hidden that most of the time the user doesn't need to be aware of, but in some cases they do. So, so what actually happens between the user broadcasting a transaction and the moment it confirms on the blockchain? So after you have broadcast your signed transaction, it gets sent to the node which your uh, client was connected to. And after validating that transaction, that node sends it over its peer-to-peer -peer network to its rest of uh, its peers. And then these peers proceed to send it over to the next nodes and so on and so forth. And this transaction then gets stored in an in-memory database, which we call the memory pool. And the memory pool can be thought of as a, as a bucket of transactions which still have not been confirmed, but will be chosen by the miners for confirmation in one of the next blocks. And typically, miners choose these transactions in order to maximize their profits. So they would usually pick the top, let's say, 100 transactions sorted by the product of the gas that the transaction will pay and the gas price of the transaction. And afterwards, the transaction will get mined and so on. Uh, so this memory pool or mempool in short is actually transparent for anyone to see. So is there anything that other people can do with the information? Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a few ways that people who are watching the, uh, the mempool can uh, exploit this knowledge of other transactions um, and or the ability to get transactions in before others to, to profit. So one sort of typical such example is when somebody participates in, a, in an arbitrage on Uniswap. Basically, when the price changes, the first person to do a trade on the Uniswap pair right after the price of that asset changes gets arbitrage profits. And that's what I would call something like benign MEV, because it's something that somebody's going to get that profit. And it doesn't depend on knowing anything about any other uh, transactions in the mempool. It just depends on being the first one to take advantage of a, of a change in the world's state. Uh, but then obviously strategies get a lot more um, complex and also a lot more uh, potentially, you, you could call them malicious. Uh, so one would be another Uniswap example is if somebody front runs a transaction. 
And so that would be if you see a transaction in the mempool that has a, a very generous slippage limit, um, you can cause that transaction to execute at a worse price by trading ahead of it on Uniswap. And then after the transaction, you can trade in the opposite direction on Uniswap to lock in your profit. Um, and so that it works somewhat similarly to how front running works um, in uh, traditional finance. And uh, it does depend on knowing, not only being able to get a transaction in quickly, but knowing the content of other people's transactions to do this. And that profit ultimately um, gets taken from the user in, in the form of worse execution on their trade. So how, how common would you say is this kind of front running uh, with Uniswap transactions? Um, I think with Uniswap transactions, the, um, the slippage limit, setting a, a relatively low slippage limit means that on a low, um, on, on a not particularly big trade, typically it won't be profitable to do this. So it doesn't happen that often. You see it happen when there's really huge trades on Uniswap that push the price really far, which could make it possible um, to, uh, uh, to, to profitably front run it. Um, and when trades have, have uh, too generous slippage limits or when the, when, you know, the, when the price has changed, has, when there's been positive slippage, in which case the, uh, the front runner can, uh, can basically take that. Hmm, yeah, so I guess intuitively you would expect when the fees go up, as as they are right now, and fees on Ethereum are very high right now, that the amount of arbitrage opportunities for miners actually goes down, or not for miners, but for for front runners actually goes down. Yeah, like the quantity of them for sure, um, and of course, a lot of the high gas prices are also driven by these front runners. So let's say you you are one of those front runners. So so you actually operate a, a front running bot. So if you try if you try to front run a a trade on Uniswap and you just you see the the regular traders transaction in the mempool and you just swoop in with a slightly higher gas fee to to basically skip the queue and get your transaction mined ahead of them. So it's not that's not really how it works, right? Because if a front runner can front run a regular user, then the front runner themselves can be front run. Right. So, um, you know, I think there's there's ordinary users getting picked off by by this, but then there's also this war going on at a higher plane between all these front runners trying to front run each other. Um, and that takes the form of, I mean, I mean, you, you can you can try to minimize that by having your transaction have exactly the same or exact just just under that gas price or even exactly the same gas price and just putting a lot of them in in order to hope that it gets included at the same place. But ultimately yeah, like if you can front run something, someone can someone can get in and, and get ahead of you, um, potentially blocking your transaction. Um, and so what happens? What we see there are these priority gas auctions, where once when there's a front running opportunity, different bots compete to get it. And this is a it's a costly auction because you have to pay the gas or at least some gas, regardless of whether you, whether you win or lose, because your transaction could still be included and fail. And this has been empirically seen to be a driver behind the increase of uh, gas prices in the ecosystem. So I believe the academic term for that is actually an oil pay auction because every like even the failed bids pay some amount of gas, and that's a very like very unusual type of auction that hasn't been studied all that much. Right, but the detail here is that when this auction plays out, let's say there's ten bids for one point five million gas at some gas price, then the people that see that they would that the ones that would lose the bid the auction, they can replace their transactions, their 1.5 million gas transactions with a very small gas transaction in order to kind of cut their losses from participating in this auction. Do you know, maybe off the top of your head, what is the minimum that you have to pay as a front runner for a failed bid? The minimum would be a 21,000 uh, gas transaction, a normal pay ETH transaction. That's the cheapest transaction you can make on Ethereum. And that applies only to your last transaction, right? So in a typical priority gas auction, two front runners who compete for the same transaction might replace that transaction a hundred times, every time bidding a little bit higher. But you don't have to replace all of these transactions, right? Only the last one. Each, each time you're replacing only the previous transaction. So indeed, you, only, you do not need to care about all your previous transactions that are unconfirmed. Because they're all, they're all basically the same transaction. You're broadcasting the same transaction with the same nonce, just with a bigger uh, gas price. So the moment that you replace once, all the other previous transactions are gone. 
Right. Okay. 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 That's that's interesting. So the way I find this topic so interesting is because it's it's a game with so many layers. At the bottom la layer, you have basically users competing with bots for trading opportunities to get their transactions included, and even this layer is, is invisible to like ninety nine percent of users. But on top of that layer, you have this game of bots versus bots that we just discussed. But on top of that layer, you also have another layer, which is the bots versus the miners. Because if we, if we consider like a very naive strategy in which the, the bots compete for front-running opportunities against each other, a very naive of a, uh, a strategy would be they, they each, basically, whenever they get outbid, they raise the bid on their transaction by 10,000 gas, right? That, 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 and that why they basically the, the price of the transaction gets bid up very fast until it captures the entire arbitrage opportunity. And what happens there is basically the arbitragers get nothing and the miners get everything. So that shows us that there's this big incentive, even though the bots compete with each other and they are actually at war with each other, to also unite against this even bigger enemy, which is the miners. So I would be curious to learn what, if any, strategies do the, the arbitrage bots employ to basically enforce cooperation among each other and like improve their, their global outcome against the miners? So yes, there are ways that you can kind of um, improve this result by basically finding a way to reduce the number of players in the system such that the auction price doesn't get, you know, you don't get all these thousands of failed transactions trying to capture the value. So what you do is that you have to figure out the ways for all these bots to collaborate. So recently a project called uh, Keep It Down, and uh, we didn't say that earlier in the podcast, but nothing we say in this pod podcast constitutes of any approval or anything of any of the projects that we mentioned. So Keep It Down, did this uh, idea where they say, if anybody tries to front run us, we will instantly um, overbid so that the profit opportunity instantly disappears. So they just say, we'll go nuclear, we don't care about you, outbid us and we will just make it non-profitable for you and for us, but they, they, they don't care basically. And this creates an interesting um, situation where you're never incentivized to try to beat them and uh, if they have good enough infrastructure, which allows them to always exercise this quote-unquote uh, green trigger, um, the result is that everybody should cooperate with them and act as a unified uh, entity. And this means that uh, from you went from a situation where you had many, multiple frontrunners who tried to frontrun each other to have a situation where all the bots collaborate with each other. Which is, which is a net improvement on the previous situation. You're kind of holding the MEV hostage. You're saying, if you try to go for our MEV, we will kill the MEV and there's no more, uh, there's, no, no, there's nothing else to take. So you're not, allowed, you, uh, that's literally what it is. Yeah, and not just we kill the MEV, but we also, like we, we, we hit you, but just a little bit, right? So, so you as well take a small loss because of your transaction. That your failed transaction. Sure, that sure, sure. But for. but because you're the keeper though, you're a big player and you can keep playing the green trigger until all the people that are willing to defect uh, are gone. And basically you've scared away everyone and then everybody plays by your rules. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, my point is you need to make it not just zero EV for someone to challenge you, but you need to make it actually minus EV because otherwise they would be griefing you. Correct, right? correct, so. correct. Where the minus EV, where the minus EV is the opportunity cost from all the gas that you keep paying, and the MEV opportunities that you are losing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So the event that brought MEV back on my radar uh, recently is your uh, an article that you two wrote together, which showcased um, what I thought was an amazing case study for what we've just discussed, which is this. Um, Actually, the, the earlier stage of this conflict of users versus frontrunners. And I think, I think your article was the most accessible 
and dramatized also like which made it so accessible to so many people but article on on on, on front running and the mempool that i've ever seen and i think it put a lot of people into into this topic why don't you basically recap what happened sure so um to set up the story somebody had accidentally so somebody was a liquidity provider on uniswap on a uniswap pair um and they had accidentally sent the uniswap liquidity tokens to the uniswap pair itself um and normally when you send a tokens uh, a token to the token contract itself or any token contract it's usually not recoverable unless there's a special case for it um and my initial reaction when i heard about this uh from the uniswap support discord was that this, these tokens were lost and then i basically like jolted awake in the middle of the night realizing that actually the tokens were not only not lost, but that anybody could could grab them simply by calling burn on the Uniswap pair. And that's because of a detail of how Uniswap works. And the key thing here, the reason that this um, became such a, such a strange nightmare is because anybody, any address could do this call and they would get the money, um, basically. And so uh, I could do this and I went and checked and the uh, pool still had these uh, these tokens in it, they're worth about twelve thousand dollars, but the uh, but anybody else could as well. So I had to do it pretty. If, if I wanted to white hat rescue these funds, I'd have to do it pretty quickly. Um, but then I heard about something, uh, a story from a few years ago from um, from Phil Dion, who's who's a researcher who studies uh, MEV and Ethereum transaction shenanigans. And as a result, I was uh, I knew I couldn't actually do this. And so that was the puzzle that we found ourselves in and that I, that I recruited Giorgio's to help with. So to understand why I couldn't just, just make this call, the analogy that, that we use in the post is to a science fiction book called The Dark Forest, which uh, I don't want to spoil on this call, but if, you've read, if you haven't read it, it's, great, it's a really great book. It's in the Three Body Problem uh, trilogy. And it has this, this concept in it um, of this kind of game theoretic environment of a dark forest. And this is an environment where... The, there are such advanced predators around that anybody who is detected will almost certainly be destroyed instantly. And so a strategy in order to destroy somebody is basically just to reveal their location um, in the forest. And this was the metaphor that came to mind when I heard about a particular kind of front running bot, a really scary one called a, uh, a generalized front runner. And we were talking before about the Uniswap front runners that do this very particular strategy by sandwiching um, Uniswap trades, but there's a lot of MEV, and in fact, computing all possible MEV um, would be an impossible is an impossible problem. But there's there's a strategy that you can do to to grab a lot of it, especially when you're in these circumstances that we were in, where anybody can make this particular contract call. So what you do is you watch every transaction in the pool, you look at you run the transaction trace for it, you look at every step of that transaction, every internal call made, and you test. What if I made that call? What if I made that call but changed the parameters to be my address? Um, you basically, you sort of brute force on every single transaction that you see in the mempool. If I did this, would I make a profit? And if so, then you generate that transaction and you front run, you front run it. And this is, a, this is a common problem for security researchers who are doing something like a white hat hack. I imagine it's also a problem for black hat hackers because I, it's in the nature of a hack often or of many kinds of hacks that, that anybody can do them. It's not, it's not some specially privileged address. So, you know, some, I think some require multiple steps and therefore are, um, are, are less vulnerable to this. But this was a case where there was literally an internal call that we would have to make in order to recover this money. And if anybody saw this call, they'd know exactly how to get the money. And so that was the environment in which we were, we were dealing. And, you know, I felt a little bit paranoid freaking out about this, but I'd heard some horror stories from Phil before about it. Um, and I didn't want to risk this money by doing that. So I called in Georgia to try to, to obfuscate it. And one, one high level point I want to make about this is that this is, you know, like, like on-chain smart contract security is a, is a really uh, difficult and harsh environment where, you know, often if there's money that can be, that can be uh, exploited from a smart contract, someone will do it. But this money had been sitting there. Anybody could have grabbed it by calling a documented function on the, uh, on the contract and nobody had for at least eight hours. But as soon as we actually tried to, we would get sniped. So the, the mempool is an even harsher environment than the Ethereum state itself. How did you even go about like approaching this problem? So the, the main thing I did, because um, as I mentioned in the post, I'm, I'm a DeFi thought leader who 
has never actually deployed a, a contract to Ethereum before, was I called in some help. So this included a couple security researchers like Sam's son and also Georgios, who was who, who uh, handled who handled a lot of the of the actual implementation. So I'll leave it to Georgios to kind of describe what uh, what we tried to do and what we what ended up happening. Yeah. So the situation is that this is basically a cat and mouse game where you try to make the time until the attacker finds the trace which generates the jackpot. You try to make that time as long as possible so that basically your transaction can get included and get mined. So basically, if you have, let's say that you put a big enough uh, gas price and your transaction would get included, let's say in the next 15 or 30 seconds, you need to be lucky enough that the attacker doesn't find it. So what we did uh, after giving some advice from the people that Dan mentioned is that we split the process in two. So instead of just saying, um, make a transaction you know, that calls the Uniswap function, which was required, we said we would have two transactions that are required to make the step, to make the, the rescue. And the two transactions, they would be sent from two different accounts in two seemingly unlinked contracts. But the moment that one of the transactions got included, it would be sort of like a precondition for the other transaction to be also executed. So for an attacker to be able to uh, kind of extract the winning uh, transaction, they would need to both play the first transaction, then what, then play whatever other transaction they, that would be in the mempool, and then also play the second transaction. So you can see that we're kind of tri- t- trying to do some sort of um, obfuscation uh, in this procedure. So what we did is that we sent the first transaction with gas price, let's say, 100. In reality, that was more like three or 400 due to all the yield farming mania, but that's another story. And um, and then, so we send the first one with 100 and the second one with 80, let's say. And what happened was that instead of using my own local node, which had fallen behind for a few days, we used Infura as our node. And uh, what happened is that when I, I sent the first transaction and I also sent the second one in the same block. So you don't wait for the first one to get confirmed. You just instantly broadcast the second one. And then... What happens is that I got a client side error from uh, the server, the, from Infura basically, that you know your transaction got rejected. And uh, what possibly happened was that because when you send it to Infura or any other you know hosted service, typically they have load balances. And uh, what that means is that maybe my first transaction got load balanced to one mempool. Um, sorry, when I say load balanced, it means that they have let's say ten computers behind some common unified endpoint. And when you talk to the one endpoint, in practice, what this does is that it sends your transaction to one of the other uh, computers. So what possibly happened is that my transaction went to, the first transaction went to, let's say, computer one, and then uh, the other transaction went to computer two. And because the second transaction required the first transaction to succeed, Typically, Geth would have both the transactions in the mempool, so it would throw no error. Uh, but because in this case, I suspect that the transactions were in different mempools, it was not able to know that there would be no error. So it, it simply rejected the transaction, which was, you know, it was a kind of a bespoke uh, situation for us at that moment. And we were under time pressure because, as Dan said, it was already, I think, eight hours or something. It was 2 a.m. for Dan. It was 8 a.m. for me. You know, I still haven't had, didn't have my coffee yet. So we, we were under, we, we had to get this done quickly before somebody wakes up and uh, sweeps the money. So let's just do it in two transactions. What can go wrong? I, I explicitly told Dan, you know, there's no chance anybody's watching. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, put yourself in our position there. We'd been spending hours trying to engineer around this kind of monster that we'd actually never seen and only knew about um, uh, sort of secondhand through effects effects that we've, we know that it, it has had. Um, and in the meantime, there was this time pressure because anybody could just remove their own liquidity from the pool um, and and accidentally trigger this this call. So um, as a result, we thought the bigger risk was was someone doing this, and so we got we got sloppy and thought, you know, look, we can we can it's still making a call. You know, this is this is deep in the call stack. It's making a call to an authorized contract that nobody else can call, reading an address from storage, which it is passing to 
um, to the Uniswap pool, we thought that would be enough um, to prevent the, the front runners from getting us. But it wasn't. No, it wasn't because, so literally the only change was, you know, firstly in the script that you're writing, you say, send this transaction, then send the other transaction. And the only change that we did was wait for the, so it was send the first transaction, wait for it to get confirmed, and then send the second one. And so we check, we check it, we see the first one get confirmed, we see the second one get broadcasted, so we didn't get the previous error. And I'm like, okay, it worked, Uh, we won. And then I click the transaction has, I go to Etherscan and I get revert Uniswap insufficient li- liquidity. And then at that point is like, okay, we got wrecked. And, uh, and then we, we go and uh, Dan finds the other trans- the transaction which front ran us. And it was, it is this kind of monster of a transaction which has um, 20 self-destructs in it. And it somehow transfers 12.5 or whatever the amount was to the attacker. And it was a pro. The Etherscan account had hundreds of thousands of dollars. It had multiple transactions um, in the past uh, days. It was uh, it, it was literally something completely automated and uh, not by some random yeah. person. And those those self destructs, as I understand them, are from are from gas token. So that's another thing. Correct. A tool that front runners Correct. use um, in order to reduce yeah. the, their gas costs. For which, incidentally, Phil Diane, who is the author of all these MEV papers, uh, is also one of the co-creators of. If the second transaction would have been picked up by the Infura mempool, would it have worked? Your idea, or is it speculative? We don't. We don't know that it would have worked. It probably would have had a better chance. Um, but uh, but the, if, if the attacker was able to just basically construct a a, a representative block every second and run the transactions in it and do this process on it. Um, and they could do this potentially in, in, uh, massively in parallel, then it wouldn't have stopped them. Um, the, the hope was just to slow them down for a few seconds. Because the idea is that the attacker just applies the mempool state on their local state all the time. And they try to see, is there a profitable opportunity here? And they, then they just, they literally take all the internal calls in the, that the function created, that the call made, and they just say, okay, this makes me money. I can change this parameter and I will execute it as a standalone transaction. Imagine that our transaction did a bunch of things, but he took the one, like the one little piece that they needed to, to extract the profit. Ah, so your strategy was basically, so you have a, a generalized front runner who does a complete simulation of every transaction to see if they can make money by taking your transaction or transactions, mutating them and replacing them all with their own address. Or a subset of our transaction, because because a smart contract call can do 10 things. So they don't need the whole transaction. They need the one little piece, which will make them the money. Oh yeah, so, so your strategy is basically to make that simulation more costly for them and take right. longer. And then you hope that basically, so the block discovery process in Ethereum that's also something unusual for an auction, right? Because you never know when the next block is going to be found. It could be, it, it could be in a second from now, but it could be in 30, uh, 30 seconds from now. And both are sort of equally likely, actually. So, so you, you hope that you make the simulation of the front runner take a little bit longer, and then also for a block to come in before they finish their simulation. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Um, ultimately, I think we could have done better on this obfuscation. Um, but this kind of obfuscation is, is an arms race that the white hats are destined to lose. Um, and the reason is, it's, it's just sort of a, a fundamental law here that um, uh, for your transaction to be included before the front runner is able to get it, some miner has to produce this block and be able to run this block and, and uh, validate it um, and then and mine on top of it and, and broadcast it to the world before... Um, the attacker can. And so that's, I think, you know, sometimes you'll get lucky, but like winning those races, I think in general is probably gonna be a losing battle. And this is something where, where th- in this particular case, uh, the fact that it was an internal call that anyone could make, um, there's basically nothing we could have done to actually make it Im- impossible um, or really hard to compute. Um, there's nothing we could do to make it harder really to compute for the um, for the attacker than for than for an honest miner, or at least not, not much harder. So um, that's that's kind of the fundamental limitation here. 
um, of the of the obfuscation strategy. So if we'd known um, if we'd known a miner, or if, or if we were able to mine a block, um, that probably would have been the better strategy. And that would be to directly submit the transaction to somebody who could include it in a block without it ever being propagated through the mempool. And so in that case, it would still be possible for someone to read it. Not just knowing a miner, but also guaranteeing that the miner does not broadcast the transaction to other miners uh, right. or users, mempools. Right. Yeah. So I don't think that would be a smart broadcasting policy by a miner to broadcast their transactions. Right? That would put them at a competitive disadvantage. Well, most miners do. When you submit a transaction to a miner, really? they typically they do. Yeah. So one reason they do is is in, in order to make the execution of their blocks faster, um, because if people have already seen the, tra- the transactions potentially. Although I got I got to take that I got to take that back because that's not true in Ethereum because you have to run the whole block. That's true on Bitcoin. It's not, not true. On, yeah. This only happens on Bitcoin because they apply the UT, the UTXOs as they arrive. Mm. Right. So cancel cancel what I said, but. Um, this is actually is the policy that most miners do. So like Sparkpool is an API that you can submit to, but it will broadcast it um, to other ones. I don't know why they do this, actually. <laughs> do, do you know, do you think there are any like white gloves service for basically broadcasting a transaction exclusively to a bunch of mining pools? So nobody, um, we haven't found one. I haven't seen one. Um, and nobody in the security community that I've asked about this problem um, has seen one. It's mostly done, I think, bespoke by um, by individual miners with people that they have relationships with. Um, I think it would be a great service, but it's kind of a very niche service. Uh, it would really be primarily for like white hat hackers. I, think, I, I mean, I see a ton of opportunities for a service like that. So I think someone should definitely do it if they hear this podcast. I hope they do. I hope they do. Yeah, and I mean, this brings us kind of brings us like back to what you said earlier, right? So, so this is a race that the good guys are destined to lose, um, because like one of the reasons is that if there's like a ten thousand dollar arbitrage opportunity, then, then the bad guys are willing to spend up to ten thousand dollars to get this. But I mean, the owner of the ten thousand dollars also should be in theory, but in practice they are not, and the white hat hackers. They never are, right? So they don't have any funds to spend on securing someone else's money, typically. Um, not unless there's like some insanely reliable bug bounty or whatever, it's some way for them to recoup the losses. So I, that's like one reason I think why, and we've seen this like with, with BZX the last days, they had a bug exploited and a white, like a white had actually found the bug and they didn't pay out the bounty. And I, I just think it's like, it's shocking and extremely like poor foresight to, yeah, basically make it so that people are not willing to recover funds for you in the future, right? So anyway, <laughs> so we we already touched on briefly um, that there's another layer of the game on top of the the ones where the bots play against the users and the bots play against the bots and then the bots play against the miners, but there's actually one. That is the reason why some people are very worried about MEV as a concept. And to highlight this, I, I picked out a, th- uh, a tweet that you sent out a few weeks ago, uh, Georgios, and it says, good day to everyone except those that do not think MEV is a serious threat to the stability of Ethereum and other chains. So what do you mean by that? Firstly, let's uh, just say that all of these attacks that come around inserting, reordering transactions by front running and so on, miners can do them for free. Miners are the ultimate, you know, they hold all the cards in this, uh, in this game. And uh, MEV is the miner extractable value. It's how much ETH a, sp- a miner can account, um, you know, given a set of transactions, some state and some contracts. And they can just get it by inserting transactions, censoring transactions, or reordering transactions, right? So today it's the users or the bots, you know, doing the reorders. But eventually, miners will wake up and they will either do this themselves or they would outsource this to some service that does it for themselves. And you will periodically, I think that eventually we will start hearing more publicly about such such, uh, services popping up. And uh, basically the issue, uh, the big danger of MEV towards the stability of Ethereum 
is uh, the following. So what they can do is that they can kind of start reorging, like doing multiple forks of the chain as blocks arrive um, in order to get MEV, which was already extracted in a previous block. So let's say that we're at block, let's say 10, and there's some, there's 100 bucks of MEV at block 11. Um, and then block 12 gets mined by some miner. I, as a miner, I'm incentivized to reorg out block 12 and block 11 and remind the transactions of block 11 with some reordering or some censorship or some of my own new transactions um, in, a, in a way such that I profit. And so this results in me canceling out two, two very legit blocks in order to improve my profit. It's a kind of... Um, it is the, the sort of attack that you will hear that miners won't do because, you know, because it is against their interests, because it undermines the chain's uh, stability, kind of like how selfish mining works. But this kind of time bandit attack where you reorg fast blocks in order to extract already extracted uh, MEV is a particularly uh, dangerous one. Let me actually uh, say, say something very briefly about time bandit attacks so because I've actually had a big change of mind about this topic so um, so something about the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum so in Bitcoin when a miner reorganizes the blockchain and let's say they go back 10 blocks and they they remove one transaction and replace it with another right for example a, double, a, a classic double span attack what happens there is that all of the other transactions go back into the mempool and then they just reconfirm again in the same order. So basically in Bitcoin, nobody except with like very, in very rare circumstances is, is even affected by a double spend that would target an exchange. And that's generally true for all UTXO based chains. But can you describe how that is different in um, a stateful chain such as Ethereum? Right. So this happens because Ethereum's transactions are much more, you know, interlinked in a way. So in the UTXO model, you add some inputs to your transaction, you destroy these inputs and you create some new outputs. While in the account model, so this means that, you know, the transaction is solely limited to the data that you pass to it. While in the account model, your transaction is very much dependent on everything else that happened in that block. Because for example, maybe, I don't know, maybe you had a, a price, let's say that you made a trade on Uniswap and because there was some other transaction that happened before your transaction on Uniswap, uh, it, it gets outside of your slippage limits, which ends up diverting your transaction. While this kind of thing would never happen uh, in Bitcoin or a UTXO kind of chain. So I understand that this is what you meant. Yes, exactly. So in Ethereum, in Bitcoin, all the transactions would replay just fine and users would be unaffected. But in Ethereum, people who have nothing to do with the attack could see their transactions reverted, uh, like without any fault of their own. So we can see why any kind of reorg uh, in a chain like Ethereum would have a much more destabilizing and harmful effect on users than it would have in Bitcoin. So that is that is my first point. And... Second, the second thing that I've changed my mind on recently. So, so we've seen like uh, attacks described that are like fee sniping, for example. Th this is very similar to the time bandit attack. It's where basically uh, instead of building on the block of another miner, a miner would go back and fight again for the same reward of that block. And there's a pretty easy solution to that to prevent that kind of thing from happening, which is. Um, you basically, the, the original miner doesn't keep all the feed to himself if, if he thinks that other miners are not incentivized to build on that block. Um, what he does instead is he, he takes the, the reward, but then he pays some of it forward in the form of uh, an anyone can spend transaction or which is a coin, any co kind of coin based reward is an anyone can spend transaction. So, so any other miner is basically incentivized to build on their block that has the big reward by getting like an, some of that reward in the future. 
And I, I, I always thought that like you can solve basically time bandit attacks in that way as well. So if there's a block that has a lot of MEV, then a miner who's worried about their block being reorged, they would just pay some of that reward forward for let's say the next 20 blocks in order to ensure that their block is buried 20 blocks deep. But there's actually a special case, and I think that's actually like the reason that like they invented a new name for this, the time bandit attack, is when you don't actually know like how big the reward in, in these more stateful chains is going to be 10 blocks from now, 20 blocks from now, because you have all these DEX trades going on and um, liquidations and, and, and so on, and so many different assets moving against each other. So and if you imagine that, for example, um, th th there is a front run opportunity for, let's say, 1,000 ETH now, and it's not worth it's not worth reorging for the other miners, but then 10 blocks later, suddenly the price of ETH doubles. What happens then? The, the reward of going back in time and actually taking that arbitrage opportunity now has doubled. And that's, that's the, the, the kind of risk that you, you have in Ethereum, but you may not have in Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, I think this, this is one reason why actually we haven't seen yet very much apparent MEV extraction by miners is that it's an extremely specialized activity um, that right now is effectively outsourced to um, uh, to, the, to these front-running bots and ultimately goes to the benefit of miners. I mean, uh, miner fees are way up in part uh, likely due to, due to MEV extraction. Um, but we think in the future that miners are either going to get savvy on this or they're going to find other ways to outsource it um, that resulted more value capture for the miners. Yeah, I mean, it's to anyone who's listening to ep to this episode now. I think it's it's important to acknowledge how early we still are in the game because you look at this game that is rigged incredibly hard in the favor of miners. So basically, nobody should, or almost none of this MEV, uh, all of these front running opportunities and so on, should go to anyone else but miners. But in practice, only a small amount of it does. And that shows you how inefficient and unoptimized miners are in Ethereum today and how much there's still um, to gain for, um, for them. So do we have any idea how big MEV is? Um, do, are you aware of any like ways to or heuristics to measure it? So I think one estimate for it would just be transaction fees, um, which is, of course, literally minor extracted value. Um, so total transaction fees on Ethereum uh, way up. I think it's been it's been around three point five million dollars uh, a day for the past week, which is which is far higher than than Bitcoin's fees. Yeah, I think that's 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 sort of the that's that's sort of the clearest. And you know, in some sense, every transaction, um, every fee paid by any transaction is is minor extracted value, right? From the estimates, I've seen some estimates, and I don't know how accurate they are. That the actual uh, amount of MEV that's potentially extractable is orders of magnitude higher than that. And some of that, some of that MEV may may require doing things that bots can't do, um, and that would be, for example, uh, censoring transactions entirely across a period of multiple blocks, um, or reordering transactions uh, not according to their gas price. Um, and so these these kinds of uh, these other if you sort of extend MEV or, or obviously double spending and, and re even reorging a chain, um, these are things that really sort of only miners can do. Um, and that potentially could be could be massively profitable, or of course could could destabilize and destroy the chain. Just from a high level, where does MEV come from? Like when you look at a chain, what are the attributes of that chain that you look for to predict that like this chain is going to have a lot of MEV and this chain doesn't? Smart contract. I think specifically, like the, the property of Bitcoin that means that there's that there's much less MEV other than other than explicit uh, rollbacks and double spends. Is the primary property for that is that there's there's very little contention. There are very few cases in which um, I send a transaction and whether it gets included or not, whether it's valid or not, um, depends on whether someone else sends a transaction uh, at the same time um, or or sooner and, and beats mine. Uh, if I'm spending my own funds, if I'm just spending on my own UTXO, there's literally nothing that anyone can do to to prevent it from being included. Um, other than other than obviously censoring the censoring the base layer, because there's no way to make a transaction that conflicts with it. Um, some Bitcoin transactions, like multi sigs 
or transactions that spend from different UTXOs controlled by different parties potentially could be invalidated by um, by other parties. And in something like a like a SUMA auction, which is um, uh, a protocol designed by James Presswich for um, for cross chain uh, Dutch auctions between uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin, um, there are, there's sort of a protocol there that could potentially create a little more contention. But like, so it's it's not technically impossible in Bitcoin, but it's so limited. Uh, Bitcoin is so limited. What could you, you could do that most transactions don't have contention? What? So, judges, do you know what? How layer twos interact with this? So, would the Lightning yeah. Network, for example, create more MEV on Bitcoin? Yeah, exactly. So, something I wanted to touch on is that any protocol that involves um, dispute transactions, which must be included within some time in the chain, uh, which means anything involving Lightning, the recent coin swap proposal for Bitcoin for privacy, all of this they involve timeout windows. Everything layer two in Ethereum, in, including rollup, state channels, plasma, whatever has been designed in the recent times. Aragon has been having some ideas around how to do some optimistic mechanisms which introduce disputes. All of these mechanisms, they directly increase the amount of MEV in the system. So today, uh, to answer the question, yes, uh, the existence of Lightning increases the available MEV in the system by the by the exact amount that you can dispute for inside the inside the Bitcoin transaction. So if there's a channel with let's say ten thousand Bitcoin or ten or whatever, um, the moment that transaction, uh, the moment a dispute transaction about this uh, rather not a dispute a stale channel close uh, transaction goes to chain. The, there must be either um, a justice transaction included within some time, or there must be you know some cooperative uh, closed transaction. If none of this happens, the money gets lost. And so the big danger in this is that the miner can just say, I, I, won't, I, I, I never saw these transactions, or well, censor these transactions, which in the end means that this is a chance for a miner to get bribed either out of band or via some uh, some some output, and uh, and yeah, this creates incentives for MEV. And this creates increased MEV opportunities in Bitcoin. Yeah. So Dan, you you already mentioned that there can be malicious forms of MEV, and the way I understand it, so these are the ones that would actually uh, incentivize miners to destabilize consen consensus for users. And then you have benign forms of MEV. So let me ask you, can MEV be good for blockchain security as well, or is it purely negative? Right. So, so benign MEV happens uh, regardless, you know, is, is going to be there regardless of whether anybody's doing any of these strategies. So the first trade on Uniswap, um, it's got nothing to do with, with monitoring the mempool um, or with censoring transactions. Um, and it's just something that somebody's going to get. Um, and uh, and the only question is is who um, there's there's more so uh, if miners um, were able to effectively extract this benign MEV um, if miners or, or someone else like KeeperDAO um, or like uh, uh, Optimism's sequencer which um, full disclosure we're, we're investors in in Optimism um, paradigm is but. Um, if one of these parties were able to extract this kind of benign MEV, um, then potentially it could be used to either secure the chain or fund uh, sort of other other public goods that are beneficial ultimately to to the chain, keeping the chain safe. Yeah. So I, I already gave two things earlier where I recently changed my mind by thinking more about MEV. So I actually until like a few weeks ago had this like a pretty extreme position on MEV, which is that most MEV is benign MEV, which is something that I still think. Um, and benign MEV directly uh, contributes to the minor reward in a basically non-destabilizing uh, way and thereby secures the blockchain. And if you combine this with like this previous guess that we had that, that like in, in practice, like, uh, sorry, rather in theory, the MEV that can be captured by miners is like, magnitudes higher than it is today, um, then shouldn't this mean that we can secure a blockchain 
purely by MEV. So if, if you if you think this like all the way through, then could you in theory have a blockchain that does not have a block reward? That not only not has a block reward, but maybe even has like some kind of deflation or something, right? You know? So it's 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 isn't that like the the perfect kind of blockchain? So my answer would be yes, but it probably requires changing how Ethereum works. Because if if all transaction fees go to the miner of the current block, um, then there's this very destabilizing um, influence where uh, miners are basically basically could reorg each other in order to fight for those transactions. Unless they pay it forward. Right. And if but if you well if you can mandate that they do, if you can take some of these transaction fees and spread them out over subsequent blocks, um, then potentially that could be a more consistent, more more uh, uh, positive effect on stability. And so I think Giorgio's can talk a little about EIP-1559, which is a proposal for upgraded Ethereum that does something like this and potentially could have this effect. How does it help with MAV in this case, though? Because it means some transaction fees will be spread out over multiple blocks. It, 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 you, you burn them, right? Yeah. So they, and, they, and there's a block reward that gets distributed. Yeah. So in effect, it's, 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 you're securing the chain by making the block reward more valuable. Let's, let's repeat that. On the one end, you're burning the rewards, and on the other, you are distributing them, but over a longer period of time and in an extremely consistent way. How is it in a longer period of time? Because, well, I guess I guess you st- it's still wrong in the sense that um, only the base fee is burned in ERP one five five nine, whereas MEV is not really in the base fee. It is in the um, tip. Correct. Correct. I think. I think. Yeah. I think. It, 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 there's a flat tax on Andre. I think. I think it would. I think it would. It would. It would uh, matter. I have no doubt in my mind that ERP one five five nine is very beneficial for blockchain stability because it creates this consistent uh, uh, incentive for the blockchain to move forward. Yeah. Uh, and, and it it removes some of this like destabilizing effect that transaction fees have that we also uh, discussed here. So totally right. Yeah. One one other thought. So if we think that all that all uh, benign MEV makes the blockchain more secure and could be used on the other end to lower the block, uh, like the block subsidy, uh, which means there's less inflation for holders and so on. <clears throat> and at the at earlier in the podcast, we discussed that there's a game going on between front runners and miners. And right now, the miners capture only a very small amount of like the possible benign MEV that they could capture because the front runners are way more like, <laughs> I don't want to say intelligent, but they are way more developed and sophisticated and way better at co- cooperating with each other so far. So shouldn't we as users or like not as users maybe, but like as, as people who like uh, think about Ethereum and develop like products on it and so on. So shouldn't we want miners to get all the benign MEV, shouldn't we try to make that a reality? Like, how, in, like in what sense do we benefit if a front runner extracts value from users? I mean, if miners get it, there's like a very strong case that this is positive for users because it secures the chain and it can be it can be used to reduce inflation on the other side. But if front runners get it, so this, in my opinion, is actually way worse. So. I would agree with the general thinking, but I think that it is based on a flawed assumption that firstly, there is only benign MEV. And secondly, even if there is no benign MEV, that you're able to separate programmatically between um, benign and non-benign MEV. So the the issue that I see is that the kinds of uh, malicious MEV, uh, like that kind of, there's a very gray line between the two, at least on a programmatic level. Because, for example, imagine that you censor a, a CDP liquidation transaction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you don't let a CDP get liquidated. Or, for example, um, you censor an Oracle update in order for a DeFi, for a CDP saving transaction to get included. Is that benign MEV or is that malicious MEV? I think I... <laughs> sorry. I think I do have... I, my definition... I'm a categorization, and I'm 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 not 100 sure on this. Um, but between basically benign MEV and what I would just call non-benign MEV would be that benign MEV uh, does not depend on knowing anything about transactions that would be included after the transaction that you are including. 
Um, and so an, being the first trade on Uniswap in a block um, is has this form where it's a strategy that does not depend on knowing anything about the transactions that come after. Um, oh, and sorry, and then and also don't depend on um, on blocking transactions, censoring transactions from being included um, uh, within one block. And so that uh, if you if you limit your strategies to only ones that don't have no, foreknowledge of, of subsequent transactions um, in them, then I think uh, that that it filters for only benign MEV, for only the kind of MEV that's like, yeah, that's like being the first trade on Uniswap in a block where someone's going to get it um, and you're just winning a race for it. So I would actually go back to what Giorgio said. So I don't see why we actually need, like for this, for, for what I said, like, for this idea if we should distribute more MEV from front runners to minor. So I don't see why we need to distinguish at all between benign and non-benign MEV because the front runners can only capture benign MEV, right? So by definition, so they can only they can only of the three things that MEV that it generates MEV, they can only insert transactions. Whereas miners can insert, they can uh, center and they can rearrange, right? So those those three things. So the front runners, by definition, have only benign MEV. So whatever whatever uh, MEV we shift from front runners to miners is thereby, by definition, hundred percent benign. And so, and the the, the non benign MEV can can be captured by by miners anyway, right? So um, th that would be my thinking. But uh, this brings us uh, just in general this uh, this this topic of distinguishing benign and non benign MEV brings us to the final part of this this podcast, actually, which is, if we could, would we want to mitigate MEV? I think I think I agree with you that um, MEV going to miners is very probably better than um, MEV going to to front runners. Um, I think certainly for especially some kinds of MEV, uh, it's bad for the users ultimately. Um, that's I think arbitrage, by the way, is not is not this like a user typically trading on Uniswap. Um, an end user uh, wants there to be an accurate price, and so it's it's uh, if it's just sort of a random retail trader, uh, noise trader, then uh, arbitrage is at least as likely to help them as it is to hurt them in terms of their execution price. Um, so arbitrage, yeah, arbitrage on Uniswap plays plays a very valuable role, and so that's going to be there no matter what. Um, I think the uh, or to give like sorry to interrupt, but to give an even more clear example, if you have uh, a CDP and maker and you're about to get liquidated like you want uh, the keepers on chain which are by definition front runners right so you want them to be as efficient as possible to liquidate your collateral as soon as possible so you get a better price a lot of ethereum depends on there being these these uh, incentivized actors um, out there that are that are watching the chain and doing all this work um, and that's why a lot of these systems can be as simple as they are um, I think as far as as far as the the other kinds of MEV, um, uh, I think some some it would be better to reduce or, or have them redistributed basically to to the to the users. Um, some I think uh, potentially it could be worth it to have to have the miners still extract them. I think some certain kinds like like particularly censoring transactions um, is the sort of thing that we really just hope a system like this does not have. Um, and ultimately, would Ethereum I think. Would basically be, have, have failed if um, even even if it's even a malign. I, sorry, I'm sorry. I think Ethereum would have failed if even a even a benign entity has the has the power and makes the decision to include transactions at all on the chain or not. Like that's 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 sacrificing some fundamental principles that you know, regardless of the value being extracted or where it's going, um, potentially damages the entire experiment. In uh, my opinion, and from past discussions, I believe there are three types of uh, high-level techniques that you can use to mitigate MEV. Firstly, uh, obfuscation. So, firstly, uh, our dark forest, for example, uh, case is a situation where you try to separate your transactions in some way um, so that they don't look like they have an MEV opportunity behind them. Um, another way... Another thing that you can do is some form of commit and reveal scheme. So first you would commit your transaction on chain uh, so that it doesn't look like there's some MEV to be extracted. And then the moment that you reveal it, the, the ordering is already committed to. And this is uh, related 
to the second um, type of uh, mitigation, which is the separation, where you want to separate execution from ordering. And there's more or less um, kind of like three techniques which you can use for separating execution from ordering. And they're all based in the fact that the miner or the block producer in a proof of stake or whatever, they don't know um, the clear text transaction before they have uh, committed to its ordering. So basically what they all do is that in one case, you can say that I will have a verifiable delay function. The miner receives a transaction encrypted and they can only learn the clear text transaction, let's say 15 seconds later. But they must commit to the ordering of the transactions in that block like now. So basically you just enforce that they commit to the ordering now, but they only learn the content later. And uh, you can also assume that any transaction that gets submitted encrypted and ends up being an invalid transaction gets interpreted as a no op, so nothing happens. Um, and anytime that you do this kind of encryption with verifiable delay functions, there's also its counterpart uh, that you can also do it with threshold encryption. Similarly to how uh, you can say that you can do secure randomness either with verifiable delay functions or with threshold encryption. They're more or less counterparts of the same solution. And the third uh, way that you can do this is by just saying that the block proposer, before they, before they include your transaction, they promise you by putting up uh, a security bond, they're saying, here's 10 Ether that I will include your transaction at uh, index number five in the block. And then the block gets mined. And if your transaction was not at the index that they promised you to, um, they will get slashed. Um, yeah, and then there's another way which I'm not a huge uh, supporter okay, of. Hold on a second. So before we move on to the the final um, yeah. the final method, I, I would have a few questions about separation. So, yeah. um, are these generally techniques that you can use on any layer, including layer one? Assuming that your layer one uh, is built with this uh, in mind. So doing this on Ethereum or Bitcoin, they would require um a fundamental change or okay uh, i believe that what you could do in ethereum is that you could have a smart contract which does the following um the miner puts up a bond on uh, a smart contract and says that this transaction hash uh, will be at this transaction index and uh, i'm just making up the protocol as i go and then after the block is mined um the user would then take uh the Merkle Patricia proof of inclusion of uh, their transaction, and they would post it on chain if the index did not match. And this is doable um, because you can uh, you can access the block hash via smart contract, and you can also provide a Merkle proof which shows that your transaction was included in that specific block. So I believe this is doable. So the proposers offering receipts and bonds for transactions at a specific index, I believe, is doable on Ethereum, not doable on Bitcoin. The time lock and threshold encryption. Uh, ideas, they both require um, consensus level changes. So does the MEV auctions that are being uh, pioneered by, by optimism, uh, optimistic rollup, uh, also fall into this category of separation? Not exactly. I think they fall more in the bundling and batching kind of uh, situation. Although Dan is more familiar with that, so he can chime in here. Yeah, so I mean, it's the yeah the sequencer component of optimism system um, is something that could be done on on layer one um, as well. I think the fact that it's that it's combined with the optimistic rollup um, gives some benefits. But the the basic idea, yeah, is that it, is that it, uh, if you have someone who is responsible for for sequencing transactions, who basically has to sign every transaction um, for it to be included before a particular uh, other, other, uh, on, on the fast track on the fast path um, for transactions. Um, then you can provide uh, a lot more assurances, soft assurances, but assurances to users um, uh, about about uh, the ordering of those transactions, um, and that could prevent you know these kinds of MEV. Of MEV. But that requires the users essentially opting in, um, and or actually the contracts themselves have to opt in because if there's another way to call this contract um, that doesn't go through the sequencer or doesn't go through something like um, like a VDF, uh, yeah, so like. Yeah. So and, and, yeah, another another way to do this would be if like um, like so Starkware has a uh, which full disclosure is another company we invested in um, has a project called Vidu, which um, which is uh, basically VDFs as a service, 
And so if you if you just had somebody um, instead of having a an, uh, a sequencer, you just said every transaction has to have a VDF on it um, and go through this go through this uh, smart contract. Um, that could potentially prevent prevent the same kind of thing, but only if the contract opts in. So this wouldn't have helped us uh, with Uniswap with the Uniswap situation that we had because that contract um, doesn't have this kind of uh, constraint on it. Anyone can call it. Uh, I see, but you could, in theory, build like Uniswap version three in a way, or Uniswap version four, or whatever, in a way that requests a specific contract, but it has to go through a sequence in order to call it. Yeah, I think that's 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 okay. certainly any any contract could be built in a way um, where the rules for accessing it are gated by either something like a VDF or something like a sequencer. Mm -hmm. So the way that I understand the concept of um, an MEV auction is that you auction off the uh, right to order the, the transactions separately. This is also basically the first time that you can um, measure how high MEV even is in, in like a market-based way because like you have a free market for bidding on that MEV. Yeah. And if, if you assume that there's not like not a cartel that suppresses like price discovery, then you you would actually discover the true price the, 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 the true price of, of MEV. Would you agree with that? Right. So the yeah the the MEV auction uh, concept which was proposed by by the optimism team um, does uh, if you did this, if you did just sort of like a pure auction on a per block basis, um, where anyone could, or, or per per minute basis, like where anyone can be the sequencer for the next minute, um, mm -hmm. paying for it, you get a, you potentially could, yeah, get a get a much more accurate price for MEV. I think the the solution that, uh, and this is this is a sort of a, a future potential part of uh, of something that up that up that could be done with optimism. Um, it's not it's not it's not part of the of the initial system, um, and the details aren't aren't really all worked out. Um, but the uh, I think is more likely to be gated um, in some ways, and rather than just being a free for all auction, precisely in order to avoid like the really most malicious forms of MEV. Um, yeah. uh, so like having having something like a white list of participants um, who can who can be removed by governance. So that that that's the sort of thing um, where yeah. But I think you still potentially learn a lot about how much MEV there actually is potentially on a chain. So another question that I would have about optimism. So I don't know if that's still on the on the roadmap, but um, in the original idea, the, the proceeds from auctioning of the the sequencing rights um, would be used uh, to uh, to fund basically public goods on Ethereum. And um, I'm skeptical why anyone would use this chain when you could also just fork uh, fork the chain and and pay the MEV back to users. For, like for example, this concept is like very established, right? So, for example, in traditional finance, you have exchanges where um, basically, like the, the worst kind of uh, of users get get paid back from, uh, so let's say, front running efforts of like of, of the, the stronger traders. And I believe this is even something that uh, is implemented today in synthetics, um, for for example. So, w w like, why wouldn't such a such a version of like the optimism chain like be vastly superior to the one that just like gives away the money. It's tough to discuss because I think it's it's all very uncertain um, exactly what these things will look like. So and it's hard to discuss without more more detail. Um, I think in general the answer to why won't someone just fork away something that does something good um, into something that's 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 more neutral or, or doesn't or doesn't do the positive thing um, but is slightly more profitable. I think is spontaneous order. Like ultimately, um, things like rollups have pretty strong network effects, um, and you want if you basically only want to be on a rollup if there's if there's other um, users on it. And so, um, even just like a like a relatively small uh, uh, fuzzy factor, um, like having like uh, not just not extracting mal malicious MEV, but also but redistributing the benign MEV to positive um, goods, I think could potentially be enough to to make that the shelling point for everyone to use. Um, as their as uh, that that roll up, and I think it might be tough to to fork that. Interesting, yeah, yeah. I think um, that's a very good explanation. So, in terms of mitigation, so we discussed you can obfusc up obfuscate um, basically your transactions in Ethereum, or you can try to separate execution from the transaction ordering. So, what is the th the third field that you can do? 
both what Rollup does and what uh, you can imagine that you have a service which aggregates transactions and puts them on chain is that the ground Gov creates a bundle, which means that either all transactions in, the, in that bundle would get uh, included, uh, confirmed, or none of them. So basically what you do is that you batch, to get, you would batch together a bunch of transactions and uh, you try to enforce this condition. So what you do is that you enforce that the ordering happens off chain and then any kind of uh, attempt at interfering with the ordering um, fails. And that's it. So you make a bundle and you say, anybody that tries to touch this bundle and reorder it uh, invalidates the bundle. Let's assume there's, uh, there's, that you have a like, sequencing service that is off chain and uh, users submit their, their transactions to it. And maybe there's also a commit reveal scheme or whatever to, to make sure that, that, you know, that, that the actual operator can't change the order of transactions. And then that, that, that service bundles the transactions and publishes them to Ethereum. So why can't at that point a miner look at the bundle and just unbundle it and rearrange it in any order they want? Right. So I think that's a case where you need um, uh, the individual users and then potentially uh, the contracts um, in some cases uh, to opt into this. So you could do it if the users opt into the, opt into it, then at least their signature won't be valid. It won't be an independently valid transaction from them. It'll only be valid when batched with these other um, transactions. So that's, that's the kind. Yeah. So, so basically if the user opts into this, um, uh, then yeah. And it, so, uh, but then in, in other cases where it's like front running, like, yes, yeah, so there's, there's no reason someone couldn't front run the whole batch. Um, and there, I think the, uh, as, as its own transaction. And there, the hope is that basically the, the transactions within the batch cancel out and all happen atomically and, and in sequence guaranteed. Um, so that, that sort of, that, that mitigates it to some extent. Ah, okay. So that is very similar to what you said earlier about Uniswap and optimism. Yep. But, it, but it's not gonna, I mean, this, this isn't going, you know, that, that sort of system is not going to save um, uh, you from the generalized front runners because they can still read through the entire internal call stack of that of that batch. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So you, something that you can't prevent is when there's an opportunity that anyone can take, they will still take it. Yeah. Uh, there are all funny implications of the blockchain's main feature that is the transparency. You know that because all the data is out there. That means that anybody can just go and pick them apart and reconstruct them in any format that they want and use them to their advantage. And, you know, like from a first principles perspective, that's why the, um, the solution with the encryption of the transaction feels like it's the most uh, proper one because it exactly tries to basically force the ordering to happen at a time when nobody knows what inside what is inside the transaction. So maybe for like the, the last question to, to like zoom way out. So neither Bitcoin nor Ethereum have been designed with the goal of like fair transaction ordering in mind, in the sense that trans, there, there's like zero guarantee that transactions are ordered in, in the actual sequence that they came in to, to mine us. And that is basically the whole reason why we have to talk about this. So do you think that there's going to be a new generation of like blockchain. And I, I'm very careful like even to entertain these ideas because Bitcoin and Ethereum have like such strong network effect and it's so hard to make something that's like 10x better. But if I had to like pick one thing that, that could be like 10x better, it would like one or the one or two things that would be that would be like fair transaction ordering. So do you think that's even possible? And like how likely is that? And we see something like that. I think it's possible. I think it's also possible that this happens on layer two on Ethereum. And I sorry, I described reason, ways that this could work um, with Optimism or, or Starkware. Um, I think the uh, I think I think ultimately any solution. This is something that Bitcoiners used to say um, was, "Oh, if anybody just creates some better feature, we'll just we'll just add it to Bitcoin." And they don't say that anymore because nobody nobody adds anything to Bitcoin anymore. Uh, but I do think. Uh, on Ethereum, you know, it's very hard to change Ethereum, but it's it's not it's not that hard. It's, it's very easy to build something on top of it. And so, hopefully, if if some other 
blockchain um, finds a way to uh, solves this problem, then potentially that will help users on Ethereum as well. Um, because someone can someone can build that kind of system on top of Ethereum. Okay, guys. So I thought it was just an amazing discussion, and I'm I'm so glad that uh, that we did this. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us on. Thank you. Thank you.